Planning delivery. When and how should the baby be delivered? The decision to deliver should be made once the woman is stable and with appropriate senior personnel present. If the fetus is less than 34 weeks of gestation and delivery can be deferred, corticosteroids should be given, although after 24 hours, the benefits of conservative management should be reassessed. Conservative management at very early gestations may improve the perinatal outcome but must be carefully balanced with maternal well-being. The mode of delivery should be determined after considering the presentation of the fetus and the fetal condition together with the likelihood of success of induction of labor after assessment of the cervix. The third stage should be managed with 5 units intramuscular syntocinon or 5 units intravenous syntocinon given slowly. Ergometrin or syntometrin should not be given for prevention of hemorrhage as this can further increase the blood pressure. The delivery should be well planned, done on the best day, performed in the best place, by the best route, and with the best support team. A few hours delay in delivery may be helpful if it allows the neonatal unit to be more organized or to transfer a mother to a place where a cot is available. This assumes the mother is stable before delivery and prior to transfer. If the gestation is greater than 34 weeks, delivery after stabilization is recommended. If less than 34 weeks and the pregnancy can be prolonged in excess of 24 hours, steroids help to reduce fetal respiratory mortality. There is a probable benefit from steroid therapy even if delivery is less than 24 hours after administration. In all situations, a carefully planned delivery suiting all professionals is appropriate. Vaginal delivery is generally preferable, but if gestation is below 32 weeks, cesarean section is more likely as the success of induction is reduced. After 34 weeks with a cephalic presentation, vaginal delivery should be considered. The consultant obstetrician should discuss the mode of delivery with the mother. Vaginal prostaglandins will increase the chance of success. Antihypertensive treatment should be continued throughout assessment and labor. How should the woman be managed following delivery? Clinicians should be aware of the risk of late seizures and ensure that women have a careful review before discharge from hospital. Antihypertensive medication should be continued after delivery as dictated by the blood pressure. It may be necessary to maintain treatment for up to 3 months, although most women can have treatment stop before this. Women with persisting hypertension and proteinuria at 6 weeks may have renal disease and should be considered for further investigation. Clinicians should be aware that up to 44% of eclampsia occurs postpartum, especially at term, so women with signs or symptoms compatible with preeclampsia should be carefully assessed. Severe preeclampsia or eclampsia can occur in the postpartum period. Up to 44% of eclampsia has been reported to occur postnatally, especially in women presenting at term. Women who develop hypertension or symptoms of preeclampsia postnatally, such as headaches, visual disturbances, nausea and vomiting or epigastric pain, should be referred for a specialist opinion and investigation to exclude preeclampsia. Women who deliver with severe preeclampsia or eclampsia should have continued close observation postnatally. As eclampsia has been reported after 4 weeks postnatally, the optimum length of inpatient postnatal stay is unclear, but the incidence of eclampsia and severe preeclampsia falls after the fourth postpartum day. The decision about discharge from hospital needs to take account of the risk of late seizures. 
Most women with severe preeclampsia or eclampsia will need inpatient care for 4 days or more following delivery. Careful review to ensure improving clinical signs is needed before discharge. Antihypertensive therapy should be continued after delivery. Although initially, blood pressure may fall, it usually rises again at around 24 hours postpartum. A reduction in antihypertensive therapy should be made in a stepwise fashion. There is no reason why the women cannot go home on treatment to be wean of therapy as an outpatient. After preeclampsia, Blood pressure can take up to 3 months to return to normal. During this time, blood pressure should not be allowed to exceed 160 over 110 millimeters of mercury. Currently, there is insufficient evidence to recommend any particular antihypertensive. However, it is good practice to avoid the use of alpha methyl dopa in the postnatal period because of its adverse effect profile, particularly depression. In breastfeeding women, labetalol, athenolol, mifedipine, and enalapril are currently in use either singly or in combination. Corticosteroids have been used in HELLP syndrome. The current evidence suggests they lead to a more rapid resolution of the biochemical and hematological abnormalities, but there is no evidence that they reduce morbidity. Follow-up and final diagnosis. What should be offered following hospital discharge? An assessment of blood pressure and proteinuria by the general practitioner at the six weeks postnatal check is recommended. If hypertension or proteinuria persist, then further investigation is recommended. Women whose pregnancies have been complicated by severe preeclampsia or eclampsia should be offered a formal postnatal review to discuss the events of the pregnancy. Preconceptual counseling should be offered where the events that occurred, any risk factors, and any preventative therapies can be discussed. Evidence suggests that up to 13% of women with preeclampsia will have underlying chronic or essential hypertension that was not suspected antenatally.